All right, we're looking at faith by faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And I guess you can turn to Hebrews 11, because that's where we'll spend practically all of the time today. So this about faith in Hebrews 11 is around the phrase, by faith, which is a phrase that occurs here um, several times, maybe a dozen times. You see it at verse 3, by faith. We understand the universe was created by the word of God. Uh, and at verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. and It goes on for some time this way. And it happens so often in the chapter that I thought, you know, it would be worth looking at all of these together and to see why, you know, what is the, what's going on here? Why so many of these verses begin by faith? Uh, what's happening? And on doing this, uh, you know, on my own, I guess, I determined that what's happening is that there's a pattern. Hebrews 11 is establishing a pattern. And uh, that's not to say that it's formulaic or meaningless repetition. Uh, repetition is to say that Hebrews 11 is trying to hammer, a, you know, a formula, a pattern, a the way that this works, you know, how, how it works, how it does, what it does, what, you know, as part of the definition of faith. And, um, you know, on looking at this, we note that the pattern begins with that little phrase, by faith. That's always the start of the pattern. And so this lesson is intended to uncover the rest of the pattern just by looking at the occurrences of this here in Hebrews 11. And uh, the first thing in this pattern that I noticed is that you have the word, uh, you know, by faith occurring multiple times in multiple verses and in every one of these verses, the first thing that comes after by faith is a person. By faith, somebody, a person. And uh, this is what you're finding there, uh, say at verse 4, by faith, Abel. Right, and by, at verse 5, it's by faith, Enoch. And so we look at what Abel did. And uh, what, what happened there that, uh, you know, follows the definition of faith here in Hebrews 11. And we look at what Enoch did. And we look at what Noah did at verse 7. And Abraham at verse 8 and, and other verses, of course. Sarah at verse 11. Isaac at verse 20. Jacob at 21. Joseph at 22. Moses at 23. You can see a succession of these things, a fairly rapid succession. You see that the people are named in verse 29. Um, as well as together with Moses in the observation of the Reds, of the uh, Passover. And Rahab is mentioned in verse 31 in the final reference to by faith. These things are happening. Um, you know, we see that the first thing, the first observation is that the examples of Hebrews 11 are generally speaking about individuals who have faith, there is, of course, that reference to the people. And one reference to the walls of Jericho. <laughs> but it's clear that the people are what's intended. When we're talking about the walls of Jericho fell, we mean the people did what God told them to do and the walls fell. But generally, we're talking about individuals who have faith. That's the idea. The first part of this pattern is that 
uh, it is a person who has faith. It's individuals who have faith. And so, you know, the the meaning of that would be that there is, you know, notable, remarkable power in the faith of just one person. That's the first thing we notice is each of these individuals is being noted for what he or she did. Um, There is just one person, but that person's faith is enough to be noted in Scripture, to be recognized and commended by God. And it accomplishes a lot of things. And the other thing that we can see when we put these up together, uh, as, as we have here in this kind of list of the verses and the names, is that there is a linear progression through, um, through the Bible in Hebrews 11. You know, this is starting in Genesis 4 with Abel. Actually, it started in Genesis 1 with the creation of the world, but I mean, it, it's going through time in the progression of the people all the way down to Rahab in this case, and he said that, you know, we're out of time to continue talking. <laughs> you know, at Hebrews eleven thirty-two. 32, what more shall I say? Time would fail me to tell of the people who come after Rahab. Well, where's Rahab? It's Joshua. What comes after Joshua? Judges, right? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, right? Going through the list of the judges, then David and Samuel and prophets. We, we can't get through the whole book, is what he's saying. We don't have time to list all of these individuals, but even verse 32 gives you more individuals who did things by faith. So there's a lineage of faith in a, in a sense, right? There's a lineage of faith is what you're seeing, right? Any one of these people... Uh, you know, we just said had power that was demonstrated by their faith, but any one of these people could have broken the chain. You know, they could have made the wrong choices. They could have chosen not to serve God. And, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't have received the faith um, or that the truth wouldn't have gone forward, just that it would have linked through somebody else, not through them. God's purpose cannot be uh, defeated, cannot be overthrown. It'll come, uh, as as Esther was told, you know. Deliverance, if you don't stand, the deliverance will come for the Jews from somewhere else. But they're in the lineage of the faith is what's happening here. These people are not all Israel, Abel and Enoch or Noah, they're not part of Israel. Rahab is not part of Israel. She becomes part of Israel by faith. No, the the lineage is faith. Those who believed in God, these individuals did what was right, and generations of individuals did what was right. And that unbroken chain is the message that we have, the word that is recorded for us. So that's the first thing, is faith resides within people, individuals. And individuals do, you know, hold the faith in their own lives. And they encourage other generations to hold the faith. So we go back to these verses, and and, uh, we won't necessarily enumerate them. Um, again, but these are the, you know, these are the players that we have talked about in Hebrews 11 to establish the pattern. So the first thing is that by faith, a person, the next bit of the formula as revealed by the verses is that a person takes action. In every one of these, that's what you're reading. 
In verse 4, by faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. And in verse 5 of Hebrews 11, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and was not found. Because God had taken him, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. By faith Enoch pleased God, see. And then Hebrews 11, verse 7, by faith Noah, warned by God concerning events unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And at verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when called out to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land. So by faith, a person takes an action, you see. Every one of these is faith resides in the individual, but also the individual, by faith, is doing something. Abel offered. Enoch pleased God. Noah constructed an ark. Abraham left his homeland. When you look through the rest of you look through the rest of the list, you got verse 11 by faith Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past age. Verse 17 by faith Abraham when tested offered up Isaac. And then at verse 20, by faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. He blessed both of these. And by faith is especially pointed here because he was blind at the time. He literally walked by faith, not by sight. <laughs> by faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons. He also was not able to see. But he's taking this action. The end of life comes and it's important to them to think to what is happening in the future. And they speak by prophecy by God. It is recorded at verse 22, by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. So by faith, he gave directions about what they will do with his body after his death. And he was embalmed in the traditional method of the Egyptians. He was a mummy. Verse 23 tells us, By faith Moses, when born, was hidden three months by his parents. So it's by faith that the parents of Moses took this action, that they hid him despite the commandment of the king. Moses, for his part, does a handful of things. At verse 24, when he was grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And by faith he left Egypt, verse 27. And verse 28, by faith he kept the Passover. So every one of these individuals who are mentioned are doing something by faith. It's not a, a mere acknowledgement that God exists. It is also a belief that God rewards those who take action. We're told that it was by faith at verse 29 that the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. And that it was by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after being encircled seven days at verse 30. That's also the people. 
But the people walked by faith in this. Because they believed God, they crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, which is, you know, kind of a frightening prospect. <laughs> as they've left Egypt in this massive crowd, and they're standing on the banks of the Red Sea, and there's a pathway through the middle of it with the waters standing in a heap on either side. That's pretty terrifying. But they trusted God, so they went in. And subsequent generation trusted God enough that the walls of Jericho fell without military might, without intrigue. By faith, Rahab gave a friendly welcome to the spies, verse 31. She did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Because she believed God and she believed what God was doing and saw the exodus of the people and knew what it meant. Because she trusted God, she welcomed the spies from Israel. She didn't stick with her own people and where she came from. She stuck with God and his messengers, which is also a theme, isn't it? That's what they're all doing. <laughs> well, as we continue... To establish this pattern, I'll make a third observation in the pattern of Hebrews 11. By faith, a person takes an action, and that action is intended to deliver from death. This is the pattern that we're seeing. By faith, this person who has this faith, the person by faith, takes an action that delivers from death. Not only are they acting because of the God in whom they believe, their action saves. So when you're looking at Hebrews 11.4, it said that God commended him as righteous by accepting his gifts. And it said there in the second half of the verse, through his faith, though he died, he's still speaking. Abel still speaks. Because of his faith, he is alive. And verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken up so he should not see death. Enoch himself lived right, walked with God 300 years, and did not see death. So it was by faith, the faith of Enoch, that he did this thing. What thing? That he walked with God 300 years. And what's the result? The result is he didn't see death. By faith, Noah, verse 7, warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. His household was saved from the flood in the ark, which was constructed by faith. How is it by faith? Well, because he trusted God when God told him about things as yet unseen, meaning the destruction of the world. They had never seen anything like that. And it looks like from the record of Genesis that they had never seen rain either, that the water at that or the earth at that time was being watered by a mist that came up from the earth. That's what it, we're told in the early chapters of Genesis. Okay, uh, we know it's a really different place, you know, just from digging around the things that you find there, this is not the same earth. <laughs> it's very different. <laughs> um, but he was warned about things that nobody had ever seen before, but because God was saying it, he believed it. And he built that ark. It, it took him a hundred years to build that ark, but he did it. And when he did so, it delivered not only himself, but also his family, who were the only people that believed God and got on the ark. But he delivered from death by doing this. Abraham also, at verse 17, when tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac will your offspring be named. He reckoned that God was able even to raise him from the dead, 
from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Hebrews 11.19 Abraham received Isaac back from the dead, figuratively speaking. Now people say he didn't actually offer him, he didn't actually kill him because the Lord stopped the knife. That's true. The Lord did stop him from lowering that knife. That is true. But you're going to have to take it up with God because he said in Hebrews 11 verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. So I won't argue with you about it. You can argue with God about it. <laughs> from God's perspective, it was as good as done. That was a done deed. And we know it was done because Abraham believed that Isaac would come back from the dead. He told the servants, you all wait here. I and the boy will go over there and worship God and we will come back to you. They didn't know what he was going to do, but you and I know what he was going to do. That tells us that he believed God would resurrect Isaac. And the interesting thing, as we continue talking about faith, and that we mentioned how they, they couldn't see earlier, in every one of these, you notice that the fulfillment of this cannot be seen. Abel is dead, if you will, in the flesh, but his spirit still speaks, and God hears that, even if Cain is not willing to listen. And he doesn't know where his brother is because, well, he doesn't know. Cain knows nothing. He doesn't care about the things of God or the Spirit. Enoch was taken. He could not be found. He's not seen. But he's alive. He escaped death. Noah, in the ark, first of all, is warned about things that nobody had seen. And then, what happens after the flood? Well, nobody who didn't get on the ark could see that. It can only be seen by faith. It's an unseen thing, an unseen fulfillment, an unseen deliverance from death. Like we said, Abraham was the one who knew what was going to happen. The servants didn't know anything. They saw him and the boy go over and worship and come back. That's all they saw. Jacob saw Joseph's children. You remember Joseph was thought to be dead. And it was very poignant at Genesis 48, 11, when, ja jo uh, sorry, when Jacob said to him, I never expected to see your face, and behold, God has let me see your offspring too. And yet when he said this, he was blind. <laughs> so he's walking by faith. But that's deliverance from death, you see. Joseph is alive. Not only is he alive, he's got offspring too. Jesus is alive, right? And we who follow in his steps are like offspring to him. Joseph's bones didn't stay in the grave. Remember he said to them at 22, you're going to be leaving, right? He made mention of the Exodus and he gave directions about his bones. You will take them with you. And they did. His bones didn't stay in the grave, you see. But that was a thing unseen. It was 400 years later, after he died. Well, some 400, you know, ish years after he died, that they took him out of that grave and took him to the land that none of them had seen. Uh -huh. This is all by faith, too. You can't lay eyes on the fulfillment of it. But it is deliverance from death. The, the parents of Moses hid him. Remember, saved him from the genocide that was that Pharaoh at verse 23. They hid him for three months because they saw the child was beautiful and were not afraid of the king's edict. So he was not seen. <laughs> and then they put him, you know, then they put him in a, in a basket and set him afloat on the Nile. And he floats to wherever God wants him to float to. 
And that's an interesting thing, too. They are saving him by faith. They can't see his salvation. They don't see where he's going or how that's going to work out, but they trust God that it's going to work out. And there he goes in a vessel made out of wood, sailing upon the waters to escape the destruction. (laughs) Emerging on the other side, triumphant. That's interesting. And of course, the people and Moses, by faith, observed that Passover. At verse 28, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. The people were saved from the one who destroyed the firstborn. There's some death involved in that. Absolutely, there's death involved in that. And in these, in this case, the people were saved. There was a warning that it was coming. Some people believed that. Some people didn't. The people of Israel believed it. And because they had faith, they took action. They kept the Passover. They sprinkled the blood on their doors. And by doing this, they saved their firstborns from death. While all the firstborn in Egypt died. It wasn't something you could see. It wasn't something you'd seen before. It happened in the night by the angel of death, the angel of the Lord walking through the camp and walking through the city. So you can't lay eyes on the fulfillment of it, but the people were saved from death by faith. It's also the fact that the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, verse 29, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. You do it by faith, and you live. You do this in the human way for the human purposes and goals and ends, then you die. The people were delivered from death. They crossed safely. The Egyptians drowned in the same water that saved the people. Just as our sins are forgiven in the blood of Jesus by the same water that we are being baptized in. When we are baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins, we contact the blood of Jesus, and that saves us while it destroys the power of death. But I've tipped my hand a little bit. Nonetheless, uh, the last example is Jericho, where you see the walls falling down after having been encircled seven days in verse 30. In verse 31, Rahab by faith that Rahab the prostitute, by faith, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And if you recall, the agreement that was reached was that she and her household would be saved alive. Whoever was found in her house would be saved alive. It was like the ark. If anybody believed that God was going to destroy Jericho, which most of them did not. They thought it was impregnable. There was no way that those walls would come down. It couldn't be done. Certainly not by people marching around in a circle, blowing trumpets. You know, what's that got to do with anything? Well, in point of fact, that has nothing to do with anything other than that it's what God said to do. So since God said to do it, well, it has everything to do with it. (laughs) Now it's important because it's what God said to do. But they're looking at it thinking that's not going to happen. That's not real. But those who did believe, those who did think that God could do something that has never been done, that God could accomplish something that had never been seen, they listened to Noah and they got on the ark. Oh, I mean, they listened to Rahab, and they entered her household. (laughs) They listened to Moses, and they slaughtered the lamb, right? It's the same pattern. We got it. We're not making this up. It's right. That's the pattern of faith. And yet it was something that couldn't be seen. She hid the spies. The people who came to her, they stayed in her house, but it didn't look like anything. It was no special extra whatever. It's just the case that when the walls fell, her house didn't. The section of wall that had her house in it did not fall. 
and they came and fished her out before they went ahead with the military campaign. And she becomes, you know, because of her faith, she becomes a member of the lineage of Christ. I believe she's David's great-grandmother. She might be David's grandmother. I think it's great-grandmother. Anyway, she's right there in the lineage of the kings of, uh, of uh, Judah. So in every instance here, you cannot lay eyes on the fulfillment, on the deliverance, because we walk by faith and not by sight. It is by faith that they took these actions and the, these actions delivered from death, not because these actions had power in and of themselves. The blood of a lamb on your door has nothing to do with pestilence striking your firstborn. It is not, you know, a witch doctor, <laughs> medicine man, superstition. It's because of what God told them to do and because they believed in God. You know, saving your child by putting him on a basket and throwing him in the river, like that's not the way that you save children. They took these actions by faith. The actions in and of themselves are not really that powerful and wouldn't have any power other than the fact that God said so. So, you know, as we said, this is an honest investigation, I think, and we're finding that there is a tremendous amount of overlap. There's a lot of similarity. It, it uh, resonates throughout all of these examples and all of these patterns. And I think that the, that is the simplest way of putting it. A person with faith takes an action that delivers from death. That's the formula of Hebrews 11. That's what it's saying over and over again for every one of these people as we go down the list, starting in Genesis and all the way through Judges, or, well, through uh, Joshua with a mention of the Judges and the prophets, you know, just to say we're out of time, but you get the idea. We've covered the books of Moses and the Judges. <laughs> But that's the pattern. A person with faith takes an action that delivers from death. That's always what's happening in Hebrews 11. But remember, Hebrews 11 is written to you and to me. It's for us. We're the people that he's talking to about faith. So what is that pattern today? Right, remember, he said there in the, uh, in the midst of that, as he was giving the examples at verse 13 of Hebrews 11, these all died in faith. Though their actions delivered from death, they nonetheless did leave the body. But they died in faith. They, they had faith when they died. Not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they here on earth were strangers and pilgrims. So despite the things that we're reading about, and we know that they have a deliverance, we know that they live today in a blessed estate in the Spirit. Despite that, there was always something else coming. In every case, they're being told about things that are coming that weren't realized for them. There's always something else. So they're pointing at our salvation today is what he's saying. These examples were intended to lead to where we are now. And so I turn you to, to 1 Peter chapter 3 in uh, conclusion here. But it's our last reference, 1 Peter 3, into the fourth chapter as well. But when you're looking at the pattern that a person acts by faith to save from death, that pattern today is exemplified in obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
First Peter 3 tells us at verse 20 that God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, you also arm your well, yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Yes. Did you see there in 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21? That there were people who were brought safely through water in the ark in the days of Noah. And that this has a direct correspondence in baptism today. Verse 21. They were saved through water by means of the ark. We are saved through water by means of baptism. Our baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins is Noah's ark today. That is how we are saved from death today. In that day, if you wanted to be saved, you had to get onto the ark. In this day, if you want to be saved, you have to be baptized. And this baptism obtains its strength, its power, at verse 21, not from the water, you know, not from the physical trappings of the action itself. It's like all the things we read about in Hebrews 11. Getting dunked in water and brought back up out of the water doesn't really accomplish anything in and of itself. It's not a work in the sense that it doesn't do anything. It's not useful. Nobody does that for a living. Nobody pays for a service of getting dunked underwater and brought back up. Or nobody has something that they're doing in life where they're like, I need somebody to come over here and dunk under the water and come back up. It's just not useful. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything without what God said. So it's not the appeal for the conscience. The power of this thing is the spiritual aspect, the faith that we have in God in the resurrection of Jesus. The fact that he died and was buried, but was raised from the dead, is what gives baptism its power, and it's the thing in which we trust when we obey. Well, who's dying? Well, the old person of sin is dying. That's why he said at 4.1, Since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, Whoever suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. We are stopping the old ways and starting a new life in Christ Jesus by faith when we obey him in this. But that's just the start. The finality of 1 Peter 4, 2, I think, is the real focus, and the rest of 1 Peter 4 you know, expands upon this. As he says, the time past suffices for doing the will of the nations. And he goes down the list of all the things that are the life of this world and uh, the worldliness that is in it, the drinking, the carousing, the orgies, all the stuff. And what it's like to be a Christian and to be different, strangers and exiles. I think that that's what's meant by the second verse of chapter 4, that we live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So if today you are a Christian, this is the call, that we obeyed the gospel 
in faith, and that is good, and that is right. And if you need to obey the gospel today, we have water prepared that you might be baptized in his name. We'll be glad to help you. And yet, for those of us who are Christians, that's just a start. We're to live an entire life in this way. When you look at the things that these people did, they did so over time. They did so over life. Abraham, in offering Isaac, you know, had first spent years trying to have a son. Then, years after Isaac's birth, till he got old enough to travel with his father and have a conversation about what they were doing. Not to mention how long Jacob lived, how long Joseph was in prison. <laughs> you know, it's a lifetime. It, it's, a, it's a habit. It's a practice over our lives that God is looking for. And we don't know how much time we have in the flesh. That's up to the Lord. We don't know, but we must determine in our hearts that we are going to serve him from now on, that we're going to remain open to correction, to instruction, that we might learn from God, might learn from his word. If today as a Christian you haven't been living this way, it's time to go back to the way things were when we started. Go back to that first love. If we can help you with our prayers, we'll be glad to pray with you and to pray for you as a Christian. We'll help each other to continue by faith walking in this old world for just a short time. Or if you need to obey the gospel, we'll be glad to help you to do that too. Please let your need in the Spirit be known by coming to the front now while we stand and sing the song selected.